Star Wars is great. The worst thing about some of these movies, though, is that they come to an ending. But how good are Star Wars movies ending? Well, some absolutely suck, and some are just downright perfect. And I'm going to be ranking each ending scene from every Star Wars movie today, starting with the worst ending of them all, which is the closing scene from The Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, I think we can all agree on this one. First of all, why did this random old lady pass by the Skywalker moisture farm at this exact moment? And why did she need to know Rey's full name? Remember, kids, you should never give your name to strangers. It's also weird since Rey is supposed to be a Palpatine, or whatever she's supposed to be. Like, I'm sure she wants to reject that heritage, and she probably also wants to carry on Skywalker legacy, but it just feels contrived to hear her say Rey Skywalker in that particular moment to the old woman. Everyone was expecting it, and it just resulted in an eye roll moment, rather than some triumphant finish. Also, think about this for a moment. In this scene, Rey is burying Anakin's lightsaber on a planet that he never would have wanted to go back to, where he grew up as a slave, Luke's aunt and uncle were incinerated here, and where Luke's sister and Luke's best friend were held hostage by the crime lord Jabba the Hutt. It's a cheap trick to win over audiences by using an iconic location, but it's one that doesn't really make sense for Rey to visit. She only knew Luke for a matter of weeks, and Leia was only on Tatooine once in her life, so why would she go there? It shows a complete lack of understanding of the characters' backgrounds on Disney's part, and the fact that it's the last scene of the movie, and by extension the entire saga, makes it even worse. Nothing can be as bad as that scene. This next ending isn't even close to as bad, but it's just not good either. That movie is The Phantom Menace. To start off, Palpatine arrives to Naboo and speaks to Anakin personally, saying that he will watch his career with great interest. I really like this because obviously it shows that Palpatine already had his eye on Anakin. It seems that he knew Anakin would have a career, as it were. And I'm assuming he meant that he knew Anakin would become a Jedi. And in the very next scene, Obi-Wan and Yoda are having that conversation. Will Anakin be trained as a Jedi or not? One awesome detail here. Yoda says that he senses grave danger in store if Anakin is trained. In the background, subtly, the Imperial March plays. I just love that. It's a little weird that Yoda caves to Obi-Wan's demands so easily, after Yoda was adamant that Anakin wouldn't be trained just moments before. But Palpatine predicted it, so it had to happen. The otherwise great ending is brought down by the Naboo celebration at its conclusion. It features terrible CGI of the parade initially, including super fake looking EOPs. The scene where Jar Jar is getting off of his EOP is particularly annoying, and an unnecessary moment Lucas added for some cheap laughs for the kids. Overall, it's not an inherently bad ending, but the endings of A New Hope and Return of the Jedi, which will come later, were already memorable celebratory endings to Star Wars movies, so The Phantom Menace just doesn't stand out in that room. This next ending does stand out, just not really for the right reasons. And number 9 on my list is The Force Awakens ending. Some of you will disagree with me, but here's why I put this one here. First of all, the whole plot of this movie has revolved around BB-8 holding the map to Luke Skywalker. We find out after everything that Rey, Finn, and Poe have been through to get BB-8 back to the Resistance that this map is incomplete. Of course, big surprise. R2-D2, who's been on low power mode for years, suddenly comes back online and happens to have the missing piece. I mean, he's literally Luke's droid. Why didn't someone think of this sooner? That part really annoys me. It just feels cliche at the very least, if not extremely preposterous. Not a big deal in terms of other stuff that happens in the sequel trilogy, but still. Then, of course, Rey and Chewbacca go and find Luke on a remote world on an island by himself. I actually think this final shot is pretty awesome, with Rey holding out the lightsaber to Luke, and it's a pretty cool cliffhanger to end the movie on. But that's also part of the problem. Ending on a cliffhanger like this one isn't something we really see in any other Star Wars movie. Typically, each movie wraps up its own loose ends to some extent, and technically The Force Awakens does that. The goal was to find Luke and that was accomplished, but obviously there's still a lot more that's left unknown. What will happen next? Not just in the grand scheme of things, but in the very next moment of this encounter. And based on the way Luke turns to look at Rey, I instantly thought in the theater that he would be angry. And that's essentially the way this moment was picked up in The Last Jedi. It kind of felt like it was just another method for Disney to generate hype and conversation online, which kind of cheapened the whole thing for me. If you're about to rush to the comments and flame my choices already, let me explain how I'm ranking these. I'm defining the ending of a movie as just the conclusion parts, or roughly the last three to five minutes. I'm basing my rankings on how objectively good I think the endings are, how well the endings conclude the movie that they're in, how the endings connect to other films in the saga, and bonus points for great music, great scenery, and important small details and good choreography. This next ending is one of my favorite favorites. Unfortunately, it just doesn't live up to the original movies. Many people consider the ending to Solo to be useless fan service, but it's practically perfect in my opinion. For this game of Sabacc at the end, they're ironically playing on a tropical moon that Lando had won in a previous game of Sabacc. They're playing for the ownership of the Millennium Falcon. It's a callback to earlier in the movie, when Han tried to win the Falcon, but was cheated out of a win by Lando's trickery. Han goes all in on this bet when Lando reaches for his cheat card. It's not there. Han took it from him. So Han wins the Falcon with Lando's cheat card, in contrast when Lando cheated him out of winning the Falcon earlier in the movie. It's an appropriate explanation for how Han got the Falcon, in typical Han fashion. Coming in at the number 7 spot on my list is The Empire Strikes Back. This was a tough one, because like Solo, it's a really great ending. Lando intends to make good on his betrayal of the Rebellion by promising to go find Han. Interestingly enough, it seems like he stole Han's wardrobe. 
Nice. Luke receives his mechanical hand just like his father did in Episode 2. He's made an amazing recovery after how badly he was injured in his duel with Vader. Considering how dark things were looking for the Rebellion throughout this movie, with the fact that they lost both their Yavin and Hoth bases, it still manages to end on a hopeful note. The Rebellion has plenty of its forces left to keep fighting and its most prominent figures live to fight another day. Arguably an even more hopeful ending is Rogue One's ending. I've heard that a lot of people don't like this ending and that it's just meaningless fan service. If that's you, I respectfully disagree. This ending is amazing. We get to see just how close the Rebels came to being unsuccessful in capturing the Death Star plans throughout Rogue One. But there's no closer call than with Vader's iconic hallway scene, which I think is arguably one of the best scenes in all of Star Wars. And after all of the main characters have sacrificed themselves for the Rebel cause, the movie still manages to end with hope in all of the Rebels' hearts. As Leia receives the Death Star plans, she is asked what the plans mean. She says hope. Now that the Rebels have the Death Star plans, there is quite literally a new hope for the cause. Thematically and literally, it's the perfect segue into the beginning of A New Hope, which are essentially back-to-back -back scenes. It's an amazing tie-in to the original trilogy and a great ending to one of the best Star Wars films. Naturally, Michael Giacchino's amazing score for this scene is titled Hope, and I highly recommend you listen to it. It's one of the best original Star Wars pieces out there that's not from John Williams. However, I will concede that the deepfake Leia looks very off in this scene, but you gotta admit, they did well with what they have. If you can suspend disbelief for just a few seconds, it looks enough like Leia, but nothing can be carried Fisher herself, may she rest in peace. This next ending isn't really hopeful at all. It's actually super ominous. Attack of the Clones ending starts with Dooku reporting to Sidious. The final phase of Sidious's plan has been set into motion. The Clone Wars are beginning. We see Obi-Wan voice his concerns to Yoda that Sidious might be behind all of this because of what Dooku told him on Geonosis. Yoda dismisses it as an attempt to trick the Jedi and turn them against the Republic. Dooku was many things, but he wasn't a liar. It's in this very moment that Sidious knows he's won. He's got the Jedi Order right where he wants them. Their leader in Yoda is blinded by his own arrogance, which drastically decreases the likelihood of Sidious getting exposed. And Palpatine knows it as he watches the Republic cruisers launch from Coruscant, with the Imperial March playing in the background. I love this detail here where Bail Organa silently bangs his fist against the balcony. He and the other senators like him are troubled at what this war will do to the galaxy and the Republic, but even he cannot begin to imagine what's in store for them. Then, the music beautifully transitions from the Imperial March to Anakin and Padme's love theme. We've escaped from the politics and dread surrounding the upcoming war, and we get to see Anakin and Padme's marriage in this intimate moment. But even this is shrouded in the same darkness that is surrounding the start of the Clone Wars. Just like how Palpatine is using the Jedi in the Republic, he's also got Anakin right where he wants him. Anakin had already given in to his selfish desires when he killed the band of Tusken Raiders, but now he's crossed another significant line in marrying Padme. It's a point from which Anakin can't return, and Palpatine knows it. This only makes Sidious's job all too easy. It's the beginning of the end for the Jedi, the Republic, and Anakin all at once. In the same way, the beginning of the end of the Empire starts with a new hope. With the destruction of the Death Star, it's been proven that the Empire can be beat, and maybe they're not as strong as everyone thought. I love the ending of A New Hope because it concludes the movie completely on its own. A New Hope could have totally just been a standalone movie with no sequels, and yet there's still room for a sequel. It's not like some movies today that will add some random ending scene, just so there's potential for a sequel if the movie is successful. So I appreciate that about A New Hope a lot. While the Empire definitely isn't done for good, losing the Death Star definitely evens out things for the Rebellion. And the crazy thing is, none of the characters say anything in the scene, but we all know exactly how they're feeling. It's really the first time we see genuine happiness for many of the characters. Even Han is embracing the moment. As Luke and Han receive their medals and bow to the rebel soldiers in attendance, there's a huge double entendre at play. Luke and Han were being thanked for their service to the rebellion, but the actors are also bowing and receiving applause for their performance in the same way that actors would bow on a stage play. It's amazing how well George Lucas executed this. And of course, this scene wouldn't be complete without John Williams' iconic throne room score, which we all know and love. This ending is just great because it's original. It's the original, and it wraps everything up so well. It encompasses a lot of what Star Wars is all about. However, the ending that does that the best of all is The Last Jedi. When most of you think of The Last Jedi, you probably get a sour taste in your mouth. Ryan Johnson definitely messed up some things, to say the least. I was 15 when this movie came out, and even that kid version of me was scratching his head at the time, wondering how in the world the Resistance would be able to beat the First Order, since everyone that was left was able to fit in the Millennium Falcon. Also looking back, it's super annoying that Rose isn't dead here. I thought, oh, she's alive, maybe they'll develop her character arc and she'll be important in the next movie. And then she just fades into the background in The Rise of Skywalker, which is super weird. She barely even speaks in the film, and she's not even Finn's love interest after that either. Yet another example of Disney's terrible planning with these movies. So you're probably wondering how this movie got so high up on this list. It's because of the very final moment in the movie, and it totally makes up for all of those blunders. The scene starts with the slave children on Kanto Bight recounting the story of Luke Skywalker. One boy in particular uses the Force to bring a broom to himself, despite the fact that he hasn't been trained in the Force. He reminds me of young Anakin. The point of this ending is that no matter what happens in the galaxy, the Force always remains. 
There will always be new generations of Force users waiting to rise up. The light side will persevere in the face of darkness. The entire resistance that's left is confined to the Millennium Falcon. Their call for help on Crate went unanswered. They think that there's no one left out there who will support them. But it's clear that there's still pockets of hope out there in the galaxy as the boy flashes his ring with the Rebel insignia. There will always be brave people ready to rise up against oppression. It's a beautiful and moving moment. This scene represents everything that Star Wars is all about. The darkness will rule for a time, but the light side always prevails. And important, powerful people come from unlikely places, whether it's a slave boy on Tatooine or a scavenger girl on Jakku. Honestly, I wish the rise of Skywalker would have done more to build off this ending. Since the entire resistance was left on the Millennium Falcon, it's kind of preposterous for them to regain their forces and build a new base so quickly. I had this theory that the rise of Skywalker would skip forward 10 or 20 years, and Rey would find the Force-sensitive children and beings, and they would train together. The resistance would slowly build up again until they could face the First Order head-to-head. -head. Rey and other light side users versus Kylo Ren and the Knights of Ren would be the climactic finale of the saga. Anything would have been better than what we got in Episode 9, let's be honest. But anyway, the second best movie ending in all of Star Wars is, you guessed it, Revenge of the Sith's ending. The galaxy is in its darkest moment. Sidious has won. The Republic has quickly assimilated into the Empire, as we see Republic Venator cruisers already being converted into Star Destroyers. On Naboo, the populace is mourning Padme's death. The funeral comes in stark contrast from the celebrations from the Phantom Menace only a few years prior. We see her holding her Japur Snippet necklace, which Anakin gave to her when he was a child on Tatooine. It's clear that Padme didn't die from Anakin's choke on Mustafar, but from the sorrow and anguish that came from Anakin's fall to the dark side. She simply couldn't bear it. To protect her children, she still appears to be pregnant. But she's not the only one that died. Anakin Skywalker Walker died with her. Sidious, his new apprentice, and Grand Moff Tarkin are overseeing the construction of the Death Star, which only further solidifies their power. Just as Padme's children were born, in the same way Vader is born. And thankfully for the rest of the galaxy, those children were born, and they are safe and sound, separated at birth and given to Bail Organa on Alderaan and to Owen and Baru Lars on Tatooine. In the midst of such darkness, and in a movie that got darker with each passing moment, there is still hope. There is still light, as Luke experiences his first twin tons Tatooine sunset with the light bathing on him. It's so poetic, especially as not a single word is spoken in the last three minutes of the film. And there's no need. The audience knows exactly what's happened. It's a perfect ending that sets up the events of the original trilogy perfectly. And yet again, just like the Empire Strikes Back and The Last Jedi, hope and light prevail. But at the moment, darkness is looming, and there's no escaping that. The moment where the light side finally won comes in Return of the Jedi, which is the best ending out of all of the Star Wars movies. The original ending is perfect in the context of the original trilogy. Some of you probably hate the Yub Nub song, but I think it's perfect when you think about how the Rebels have liberated Endor and the Ewoks from the Empire. When Anakin's Force Ghost appears, portrayed by Sebastian Shaw, it's an amazing moment. Shaw looks nearly identical to how Vader looked at his death, which is extremely important. It shows that Anakin was always there, just under the surface. Anakin never truly died to Vader, which is why his Force Ghost appeared this way. And as Vader's body is burned, anything that was left from that shell of a man is gone on forever. Anakin won. He was the chosen one. But the remastered version is arguably even better because it's all-encompassing for the entire saga. Seeing all of the worlds celebrate alongside the Rebels on Endor just shows the scale and reach of what the Rebels have accomplished. From Bespin to Coruscant to Naboo, all of the galaxy is joining in the celebrations. The soundtrack for this ending still keeps the tribal feel of the Ewoks music, but it's much more moving and emotional than the Yub Nub music. And of course, in the context of the entire saga, we get to see Hayden Christensen himself looking upon Luke and his friends alongside Yoda and Obi-Wan. Obi -Wan is finally validated about his choice to train Anakin. He was right. Obi-Wan and Yoda share a look in this moment, and I think Yoda is acknowledging Obi-Wan's wisdom here, as Obi-Wan looks down at Yoda and says with his expression, I told you so. It's the perfect, unbeatable completion to an incredible saga.